everybody to episode two of Hearn and Bell, you talk the talk. Quite remarkably, number one, we've made it to, to episode two. Number two, this is going to be released actually a week after the first episode, which is exactly what we planned. And number three, it went really well. The numbers were really good. Um, and there was loads of headlines. Firstly, I've got to apologise to Tony Bellew for getting everybody talking about Ruiz against Bellew one. <laughs> And I see that floating around. Tony, how are you doing? Another week in lockdown? I'm all right, mate. Uh, cracking on, surviving. And what can we do? We've just got to keep ploughing ahead, mate. And uh, try to stay out of the vision of uh, the big boy, Andy Ruiz, while we're at it. Well, what was that like? Because I know that, and by the way, I have to say to everyone watching, you have texted me since, basically saying, how much money's in that fight as well? Like half, you know. I know, I know you really wanted to know, but yeah. I wouldn't let you do it anyway. But... What's that been like? Because I saw a couple of bits on Instagram, him coming back to you, and yeah. it's almost actually quite... Did you meet him in Saudi? Uh, I didn't get to meet him in person. Uh, he's obviously a great fella, isn't he? But uh, it's just one of them things, mate. If you, if you challenge me and you throw the gauntlet down, it's only a matter of time before I bite. So I'm all right to ignore him for a little bit, but carry on, mate, and I will soon come out the door firing on all cylinders. So uh, it was all right, mate. I said, I don't know him personally, but... He uh, seems like a good guy. AJ speaks very highly of him. And uh, what can you do? So we're going UFC today, tonight, as yeah. we promised last week. We're going to be talking to two great guests. Firstly, the former world UFC middleweight champion, Michael Bisping, and also ESPN's MMA correspondent, Ariel Hawani. We're going to be talking about the transition of fighters to the octagon. Some people might know, might not, that you had a few approaches and you still get some approaches about making that switch. I want to hear from Bisping, I want to hear about the return of MMA, particularly the UFC, which is touted to take part, place next week. But firstly, before we go into Michael, who's waiting for us in Los Angeles right now, I want to talk about SAS, Who Dares Wins? Because we know, Tone, when you retired in the ring against uh, Usyk, you did say you're going to keep a nice low profile, don't bother you, so... We're delighted to see you on Primetime Channel 4 once again, especially yeah. with our new show here. Then in the headlines, talking about a possible fight with Andy Ruiz. You're we'll just picking up where these so trolls have left see off. you a nice low absolute price piss price. taker. Oh. <laughs> Do you know what? I'm keeping, I was and I did want to, but then at the same time, I've got to carry on in the living. You can't do and you also, can't keep, I always, I want to go back to people on Twitter when they say, oh, I'll bell you again. Look, there he is keeping a low profile. It's been a couple of years. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, Sky, I always love talking about boxing. It's the only thing I really know. So that's why I stayed in touch with Sky Sports. It took a little while off. But you've got to keep earning. It's as simple as that, mate. And uh, people will say, well, when is enough enough? Ed, you will be the first to answer that. Enough is never enough. So you've just got to keep earning. I mean, listen, I've got an extra mouth to feed in this house, hungry kids. Uh, but forget about me anyway. We've got the best MMA fighter that's ever come out of this country. Britain's only and first ever UFC champion. Uh, defeated against all the odds. He's beat everyone who you could think of, mate. He's beat had ups and downs in the UFC. Michael Bisping was speaking to him, Ed, so it's, it's an amazing guest to have on. And as I say, he, he's he's an, he's an exclusive club. He's a one of a kind. You know, he's Britain's first ever MMA UFC champion. So I can't when wait to you, speak to him. But as fighters, yeah. And as warriors, as warriors, ooh, <laughs> the rings. You, when you look at MMA guys, is there like, mm. is there the, the same? I know boxers always feel like they're these, you know, special creatures and yes. warriors and fighters. And mm. when you talk about the UFC guys, is it like, it's a bit like footballers who probably watch rugby players and go, you know, see that. leave that one out. Is it? Is it yeah. the same? Is that a respect across at MMA as well? Because this is a, so you look at it sometimes, especially on the ground. You know, and they're standing over, pummeling on the ground. I mean, it's, it is a brutal sport. I've studied it and watched it for years from the Mark Kerr days, the, the Coleman days. I've been watching it and been a massive fan of it for years. When Michael came about, he was the first one, as I say, from these shows to take it over there. He went into the Ultimate Fighter series and uh, with various other guys. Chris, I think Chris Lieben was in it with him as well. But for a boxer looking at MMA guys, I don't know. I always wrestled and I could always do things differently. I always trained alongside my dad. So grappling and wrestling and bits like that was always involved. I carried on and done it when I first turned professional. 
but make no mistake. I mean, if anyone with any kind of pedigree whatsoever was to take me down to the floor, mate, they would pull fucking arms off my body or the ankle off my leg. Uh, anyone with any kind of skills. But if there was a stand up, I'll listen to Vaddy. It, it, it's a different, it's a different sport. It's like saying, well, rugby and football are similar because they're both played with a ball. You couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, but you but know, in that it respect, doesn't, it fighters doesn't stop fighters, people talking. In that respect, fighters, <clears throat> boxers, sorry, have got a better yeah. edge fighting in the octagon mm. than an MMA fighter who's got fighting in the ring. Without doubt, without a shadow, that we've got because there's only one way to lose in a boxing match: get punched in the face. There's only one discipline here that we're talking about. When you go into a cage, you're talking about four, five, six different disciplines. You have judo, karate, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Jesus Christ, I mean, there's so many different ways to just natural wrestling. I mean, being a natural wrestler is such an advantage. So someone like Daniel Cormier, uh, Olympic wrestlers with the pedigree are just they're so hard to beat. They're virtually impossible. And when you've got fights like John Jones who have mastered all the different sports and all the different techniques of wrestling, of Brazilian jiu-jitsu, of a bit of boxing, you see, they can't focus on one sport. Now, Michael Bisping, as we'll hear when he comes on, is was focused on boxing. I think he started off kickboxing and got to a really good level. Uh, but I just don't think it, it fulfilled exactly what he wanted. Uh, was it physical enough? Probably not. I started off with kickboxing. Uh, Dillian White's another one who comes to mind. Yeah, well, you know, These guys could mix it, but believe you me, Ed, once they get in, if someone like... I'm trying to think. A, a really good heavyweight on the floor. I mean, if someone like Daniel Cormier gets older, someone like Dylan, he, he's going to tie him in knots. But if mm -hmm. Dylan stands up and hits Daniel Cormier with a right hand, he's going out like a light. Make no two ways about it. Uh, it's, just, it it's horses for courses. But it still doesn't stop the boxer coming out and saying, I'll take your head off. You know yeah, what yeah. I mean? But there is some guys that I'm not going to mess around. There are some big boys in the UFC in that heavyweight division who are very, very dangerous too. Well, let's bring him in. I've, I've never met this man before. Have you met Michael Bisping before? I haven't met him in person. I've only been oh, a fan of him before. I'm quite, I'm quite a big fan. I loved, loved what I saw from him in the back end of his career. I know if we want to bring him into the chat right now, live from uh, Los Angeles. There he is. I can't see. There he is. <laughs> What's there up, he is. Fellas? Look, he's, he's an old pro. Look, he's got, he's got the vodka and tonic. He's got the mic. <laughs> <laughs> the microphone, the headphones. Got the full setup, fellas. How are we exactly. doing? I'm good, mate. How are you? Thanks for joining yeah. us. My pleasure. Nice to talk to you. Thanks, How are you doing, mate. Tony? I'm all right, champ. How are you, mate? Yeah, good, mate. Good. Early Tony, in the morning. Tony was just saying, Michael, that you're very lucky that you've retired because it was 100% <laughs> he was ready to take you out in the octagon and, you know... Ignore the shit. No, 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 no. It's, it's all good, mate, because, because it does not disappoint because I thought, I guarantee we get it <laughs> at some point. Two seconds in, straight away, off the I bat. It's the promoter in me. It's the, I'm really yeah, that's the promoter. Yeah. Obviously, God, we know that can't happen, happen now. Yeah, but no, exactly. Can you, can you imagine? I mean, we, you know, one of the things we're talk, talking about on this show is the crossover, you know, boxers yep. coming into the octagon and vice versa. But there wasn't, couldn't really be more of a natural, you know, you've got you, first British UFC champion, Tony World champion, Manchester, Liverpool, would have been absolutely colossal. Colossal. Would have been fantastic. Might have got my head smashed in. I don't know. Well, <laughs> but, but, but the, but the payday would have been nice. I guarantee it would have been 1-1 one, one if you did the two I've, disciplines. I've just sure. been telling him, the minute one of our boys goes on the floor, they've absolutely had it, Mike. I'm trying to explain to Ed the difference in the quality of wrestling and the pedigree of jiu-jitsu and so many different disciplines are on the line with your sport. There's so many ways to lose in boxing. It's just so clean cut and it's so... I don't want to say so easy because it's obviously not, but you know, you get what I'm saying when there's so many yeah. disciplines on the line in yours. Yeah, well, well, definitely when it comes to the wrestling side of things. I mean, I've done MMA my entire life. I started doing martial arts at eight years old. So I've, you know, the entire time working towards stopping wrestlers, right? Stopping them taking me down to the ground. And still, still it's a fucking headache. Do you know what I mean? My entire life. So a boxer that hasn't done it, do you know what I mean? They, 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 they might do a few sessions and think, yeah, I've got this. But then you go up against a world-class wrestler, you know what I mean? And, it, and they're just a nightmare, mate. So, uh, yeah, there you go. How are we doing? So, so what is this? Is this a podcast? Uh, what, no, what it is, it's, it's mad. So we're all stuck in lockdown, obviously. I know you're in Los yep. Angeles, but same, same problem. So last week, I thought, oh, I'm just going to start another show. And I was trying to find someone that talked a lot. And I found someone that talks more than me. 
It's Bellew. So last, <laughs> basically, Mike, I'll last week, you, I started saying that Tony's been telling me he wants to fight, come out of retirement and fight Andy Ruiz. It blew up all really? over the internet. So now we're going to start the rumours yeah. that you two are coming out of retirement to fight each other. It's going to be everywhere <laughs> as well. So it's really about, you know, just talking boxing, talking. And, and one, of the, one of the subjects that came up, it was Dillian White, actually, who talked about the fact that he would like to have an MMA fight, you know, try and become a world heavyweight champion, move into UFC after. He was a kickboxer. You know, he, he claims to have, to have done some wrestling. And it was just the fascination of, because we've never seen it, have we? We've always talked about it. And obviously, Connor crossed over into the boxing world as well. But we were saying earlier about, we feel that boxers would have more chance in an octagon than an MMA fighter would have in a ring. Just purely because there's, there's only one way to win in a ring. <laughs> you don't like hold, that, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. An MMA fighter would have more chance in a boxing ring or a boxer no, in MMA? No, a boxer in MMA. He tried to wind me up. No, that's what Tony said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we had a, I, I trained with Dillian back in the day. He came up to uh, one of our training camps for a while and helped out Rampage Jackson. I don't know if yeah. you know who he is, but he was training at the time. Yeah. So, yeah, so I know Dillian a little bit. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we had that crossover, didn't we? Connor and Floyd and, you know, that was fun. It was good. But I like seeing boxers go against boxers and proper MMA guys yeah. going against proper fighters. Do you know what I mean? Because they're, they're very different sports. I love boxing. I love MMA. Once you cross them over, I don't know, you're just setting someone up for a fall, really. Mm. We've seen it before, as we, we've seen a long, long time ago. Well, it feels like a long time ago now. Uh, James Tony thought he'd try his hand and just got absolutely manhandled by Randy Couture in one of the most embarrassing things I've ever seen. He but again, fell over. that was a total setup, right? Because they gave him yeah. the worst possible matchup. Randy Couture knew full well he's not going to stand yes. and trade <laughs> fucking blows with that guy. He's just yeah. going to ankle pick him, take him down, and then tap yeah. him out. And that's exactly what we saw. So it's, it's kind crazy. of a setup for the fighters, but also for the fans. It's a nightmare because you want to see a good old fashioned fight. But then when the boxer just gets taken down straight away, and tapped out, you, you kind of leave a little pissed off. I know I was. I would uh, at least like to see them trade a little yeah. bit on the feet. You know what I mean? Uh, the only match I could think of for Dillian off the top of my head would be someone like Alistair Overeem against Dillian White. I don't, I've never seen Alistair Overeem really wrestle much, Mike. Yeah, no, I've got a better one. O o right. Overeem's actually a really good wrestler. And if you look at Is his he? record, he's got, yeah, mate. And he's got a ton of submissions. I think he's got more submissions than what he has knockouts earlier in his career. Somebody like uh, Francis Ngannou. That'd be good. Uh, yeah, Garni, yeah, a banger. He can't wrestle to save his life. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But if he connects with you, yeah, that was... good night, mate. Good good night. Night. And Garni against Dillian thing. White, mate. He's an absolute monster. Mate, that's the last thing Garni can't half bang. It, it, it's the, do you know one big thing that people forget about in the UFC as well? It's them fucking gloves. I've seen more padding in gloves out of next. I'm telling you now, mate, there's no padding in them things. They are just... Thorman's gloves made for the Saturday night, I'm <laughs> telling you now. There's yeah, they are. They're, they're just there to protect the hands pretty much. And that's the problem, yeah. you know, when you're training for a fight. Because when you have the boxing glove on, which we, we train in the boxing gloves all the time, but you do develop habits of defense with a big glove. But then when, when, when you try those same, you know, defense mechanisms with a small glove, you know, if you're here, they can just come in straight through, the, you know, the little gaps that you leave open where a, a, a 10-ounce glove, 12-ounce glove, whatever, that's not going to get through. So... Yeah, they are a pain in the ass, trust me. I felt like far too how's many life, times. How's life for you, Mike? I know you're out there in Los Angeles. I mean, you got your book out, Quitters Never Win. And you, you know what I like about you two is, is I feel like you're both in quite similar positions where you may never have been the one that was expected to go on and, and become the, the world champ or the star. But you've gone out there, you grafted at times. Similarities are taking late notice fights. You know, you famously did as well, Mike, in that respect. But Built a lovely life for yourself. Happy? I mean, any regrets? I mean, I, I know you, you loved it, you know, and it was, I, I come into just watching MMA and UFC particularly late on, and it, it felt like at the end of the year, you jumped, the end of your career, you jumped into a few fights. You kind of knew the end was coming, but it was kind of like, you know, you, you found yourself yeah. bundled into fights quickly. Yeah, well, first off, Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, no regrets. You can't live your life like that. But uh, yeah, it all worked out, you know. And, and as you say, you know, I kind of had an up and down career. I got number one contender matchups a few times and I lost those. Now, there was a lot of steroids uh, involved back in the day. Not from me. I've never touched anything in my life. But back in the day, everybody was on steroids. And then USADA comes in, the United States Anti-Doping Association. And all of a sudden, I'm champion of the fucking world. 
You know what I mean? Uh, I'm not saying it's a coincidence, but there you go. But uh, yeah, you know, listen, uh, I, I had a lot of injuries over the course of my career. You know, I lost the vision in one eye, unfortunately. So I, that happened in 2013 and I didn't retire until 2018. So I knew I was on borrowed time. I knew it was only a matter of time before, you know, I, I lost my license or whatever, or the commission would have claimed me. So, uh, you know, just tried to make the most of it. You know, 2016 was a good year, won the belt and then had a couple of big fights. And then, you know, what more are you going to do? You know, you, you, you just keep flogging a dead horse. You know, it is what it is. Made some cash, opened some doors. You know, I'm living in California. I do miss England, though. Fucking hell, I miss yeah. it desperately. <laughs> but uh, this place drives me up the wall. No offense to any Americans around there, but <laughs> the only problem with America is that it's full of Americans. You know, yeah. the weather's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> they just, they don't, they don't get the banter either, do they? You know, sometimes, right, I go over there for a press conference and I'll stand up. And I'm like, and I'll just, I'll just, a little throwaway sarcastic joke. No idea. No, not yeah. even, not no even, idea. no expression in the face at all, you know? So. Listen, this is, there's a lot of amazing Americans, so I'm, I'm only joking, but, uh, but you're absolutely right there. I mean, like, for example, I remember one day I was talking to some woman and she said something. I said, ah, it's not the end of the world, is it? And she's like, well, of course it's not the end of the world. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, it's an expression, love. Is it, I, I know it's not the end of the fucking world. Jesus Christ. <laughs> one, one, I want to talk to you in a minute just about the UFC returning, which yep. unbelievably is next week. I've only just realised when I was talking to Tony earlier. We know that Dana was trying to come out. I've got a question like for personal research more than anything. Being part, I think what the UFC do so well is the younger fighters coming through, it really is the golden chalice, isn't it? Like every young MMA fighter wants to be a part of that circuit of, of UFC. But I feel like in boxing, fighters have a lot more control than fighters do within the UFC. And sometimes I'm a little bit jealous as a promoter because I feel like Dana can have the opportunity to say, right, is it really like, right, you're, fight, right, you're gonna fight him and that's the day, crack on. Yeah. You know, in boxing, it can become so frustrating when you're talking about other promoters, other networks, and there is, this sort of perception of UFC that you are sort of told what to do. Has that changed over the years from when you first went in? Do you feel like Connor sort of almost, my, my old man's got a great expression when he says, it's a bit like when you go into the dentist and you open your jaw and he stands over you with a massive drill and you just reach down and you grab the dentist by the bollocks and you look at each this other is the, and die. This and is like no, what I watch on Twitter, the, the no context Eddie Hearn. That's a clip right there. <laughs> it's like you're out. right there. He has the mouth open and you just, <laughs> I'm like, whoa, where's grab, this going? You grab each other by the bollocks and you say, we're not going to hurt each other. You've been going too loud, fucking hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you um, know fighters have, have, have got more power within the organisation now? I know what you're saying because in boxing it's very different, right? There's not one you know, overarching promoter that controls everybody and whatnot. But I don't think control is the fair, is the right word, to be honest. Of course, UFC is the biggest player in town, right? And there's, you know, there's Bellator out there, but it's not even a close second. It really is. And that's no disrespect to Bellator. They're doing great things. They look after the fighters and things like that. And I wish them all the best. But in the UFC, I, you know, to be honest, control isn't the right word. I mean, Dana doesn't crack the whip. You, you sign your contract if you want to fight and they present you in a an opponent and it's up to you you can say yes you can say no if you don't want to fight you know they don't force you to fight and they're not going to cut you you know uh, of course you know you're not going to be as active you know and you, you know the fans de don't necessarily like to see that from a fighter right? a guy that picks and chooses his fights but you do get a say you know what i mean certainly if you become a champion then you're kind of in yeah. control there but um yeah i mean does that answer your question or it's got a monopoly. I just, think, I just think it's fascinating, Tom, because it's, it's like got you know, a monopoly, Ed, and, and yeah. it can't be beat. I mean, they, what Dane has created with the UFC, I mean, it's unbelievable. When the Ferritas were with him, uh, it, it was it was huge, but it, it's grown every year. It just grows and grows and grows. I mean, you've got to remember this fellow was on the verge of bankruptcy. His whole thing was on the verge of completely shutting down until Forrest Griffin and Stephen Bonner nearly murdered each other in a cage and then it just it just exploded and he's never looked back since and I think what he's learned is to take away I don't want to say responsibilities from the fighters but take away the decision making as much as he can from the fighters because he understands what the public wants he understands what he's got and what he can do with it and, and you know you've got to remember he's Conor McGregor is a megastar yes and he's worldwide globally known that's down to as much of Dana White as it is him. 
It's because he's put him in the position to give him the opportunity to shine the way he shined. And, and the UFC has shown once again that it, it lives without Conor McGregor. It lives without, No fight is bigger than the UFC. That's one thing I will say is I, I did actually think the UFC would suffer when John Jones failed things again and things went wrong for him because I'm a huge fan of his. I thought it would go wrong when my missus and kids are pissing around. If I could turn this round now to put a, to put a gold fucking wig on me three and a half month year old son. Behave, will you please stop doing shit like that? So they thought that the, the game would collapse when Conor McGregor went nuts in New York and threw the bus at Kibbe. All, just, all these, but he, he, he finds a way to, to just reinvigorate things and just keep it going. He's a genius at what he does. He really is. And, and I know it, it, for the boxer, but listen, if it was me going to the UFC, I couldn't deal with him. I, I, I couldn't deal with someone like that. You know, you do this, you do that. Uh, but he gives you the option, like Mike says. Yes, you know, contracts put in front of you. He picks it up. You bully fight this opponent. Yes or no? To me as well. awesome. You say to me as well quite a bit. Now you're managing to fight. You, you know, you often mm. say to me, "You got to tell him, Ed, this guy, he's got, they've got to step up and fight." And I yeah. think that's the difference. And I think that's where the growth of UFC, I think, has, has almost gone past boxing because you're getting the matchups you want. Mm. It's almost like right, we want to see him be him. Okay, you know, the biggest part of the UFC where everyone misses out is everyone's got a backstory. So, you know, the fights in the UFC, when they hit the main event, we know the story because we've watched them grow and we've seen them fail up and everything is, is covered. So it's not like, you know, a boxer breaks out and we don't know where he's come from, what he's done. That doesn't happen in the UFC. We know his backstory because they are so good with the editors, the publishers, the, all the different people on the TV and the behind the scenes with the network. They give every fighter a backstory, mate. So it's yeah. like... They've got fans no matter where they are, Mike. Everyone's rooting for, for each other. No, for sure. So, so back to your point, what you said earlier about the, you know, never being another Conor McGregor or whatever. There's always the next star. There's always somebody else. I mean, back in the day, it was Tito Ortiz. Then it was Chuck yeah. Liddell. Then it was Ronda Rousey or whatever. Do you know what I mean? There's always that guy. Now, of course, Conor has transcended to be bigger than all of them. He is an absolute global superstar. But the UFC is such a powerful machine and they have such a, a finely tuned machine that, that, of course, you've got to have the star power and you've got to be able to fight. But if you've got that, if you take those boxes, then, yeah, they, they, they can make another star. They're, they're such a massive company. Um, regarding what, what you were saying there about, you know, um, the UFC... Uh, uh, sorry, I, f I forgot the point you were trying to make and I was trying to blag it there. I was trying to blag it. I was halfway through what I was saying and I forgot it. So I was slowing down. I was slowing down. Like, I've got no idea what I'm fucking saying. I've just got out of bed. I'm on my first coffee. <laughs> what were you saying? You answered the question. You answered the question. I wanted to know more about the structure and I think you answered the question, but I won't keep you too much longer, Mike. What I want to say is next week UFC are due back. Where do you sit yeah. on that? Like, just ethically, but more importantly, as a fighter, I was just saying to Tony before you come on about I said, you imagine you had to fight Usyk or you had to fight David Hay in a TV studio mm. with no crowd. Well, and well said, I did it. I mean, I commentated an event in Brasilia uh, in March, right before the lockdown started. I flew out there and everything was kind of normal. And then when I got there, events were being cancelled. There was the UFC event in London that got cancelled. And then they informed us, listen, the event's going ahead this weekend and there's going to be no crowd. So that was a little unusual commentating there with no crowd. But to be honest, when the fights start, I mean, Tony knows this, it's just you yeah. and your opponent. And whether there's a sold out crowd or five people there, they're both trying to knock you out and there's a lot at stake. So the fight's still delivered, you know, the motivation is still the same. Win the fight, don't get beat up, you know what I mean? I uh, so, so, the, so the yeah, so the fight's delivered. Uh, of course, the UFC comes back next week, UFC 249. That's a massive fight card that, uh, from top to bottom. I mean, it's just absolutely stacked. Almost every event, uh, fight could be a main event. And then after that, they've got one on the Wednesday. Then they've got one on the Saturday after that. And then they've got one the week after. So I'll be yeah, out there. I'm doing it, Mike. Out. Pardon me? Where, Where are they doing, doing it? it mate? Florida. In, yeah, in Florida. So the governor of Florida has deemed certain things essential, like UFC, like WWE, which is hilarious, yeah. but there you go. Hey, if it's essential, <laughs> I'm no fucking governor. Do you know what I mean? Uh, needs uh, bowling. Bowling is another one that has been deemed essential, which again is kind of hilarious, but whatever. Um, so, so, so I'll be there. I'm flying out there. I'm a little uneasy about that, but I've got an N95 mask. There's going to be no one sat next to me. When we get to the arena, the commentators, we're going to be on separate tables. We're going to be wearing masks. There's going to be no crowd. Everyone's going to be tested going into 
into the arena. So the UFC are going to do everything they can to ensure that, you know, the fighter safety, the, the commentator safety, you know, so there's going to be less than 50 people in the building at one time. So listen, it sounds like they're doing it where they're really mitigating the risks. You know, of course, you can't always eliminate a risk, but uh, they're doing everything they can. The fighters want to fight. They want to get paid. I want to see some action. I can't wait for it. I've missed it dearly. And next week, you know, we, we, we get back to business with a massive fight card in UFC 249. Thanks, Mike. Mike, before you go, just one question I want to know is, I said to Tony earlier, so you two are captains, right? You're going into, Tony's got three boxers that are going to fight in the octagon, and you've got three MMA fighters that are going to fight in the ring. Who do you choose? Forget the weight classes, just pound for pound, who you feel could do the best in that discipline. Three MMA you, fighters. Tony. Yeah, go on then, Tony. Go on. Let's see what you got. Uh, in a boxing ring, I would definitely You're take Dylan. You're a shit-stirrer, Eddie. I like it. I like it. <laughs> I would take Dylan definitely as one. Uh, do you know what else I'd take would be, be a surprise, but I know he's not daft. I know. Would be Del Boy. Because, like, what? mate, if you get in a rook with Del Boy, I'm telling you now, mate, he's not daft, and no one's going to pick him up and lash him around like a rag doll. David A can actually wrestle as well a bit. Uh, but then... I, I, I'd have to put myself over David Amy. It's over me, Delboy, and Dylan. All right, all right. Listen, I've got to say this. I've got to fly the flag. Steve Miocci would take them both down and, and, and sort them out, no problem. Francis Ngannou would bang them both out on the feet. So no disrespect to why, Robin. I'm British myself, but I've trained with them. Do you know what I mean? Ngannou would flatten him. Steve would take him down. DC would take him down. So uh, there's two of your three gone out the window. And I guess uh, Ngannou would be one of my picks. Who else? Who else we got then? Ngannou. I mean, Connor did okay, didn't he? He went up against Floyd. He was 49 and 0. He did all right. So we'll throw Connor back in there one more time. And uh, who else is good? I mean, we've got you know, they're talking, about, they're talking about Khabib. And, and yeah, come on. Come on. That's never going to happen, is it? I mean, Khabib's great at what he does. He's a great mixed martial artist. And, and he's confident, sorry, competent with the hands because of the threat of the wrestling. So, see, I used to have this all the time. When you're going up against a good wrestler, you're just worried that whenever you throw a punch, they're going to come underneath and grab your legs. So, you, so, so you hesitate because you're like, shit, as soon as I throw a punch, he's going to grab me. So, you, so you're waiting for them to shoot and grab your legs, and then bang, they smack you in the fucking face, and you're like, hold on a minute. This isn't what's supposed to be going down. You're supposed to be trying to wrestle me. So then he just messes with, you, messes with you psychologically. So Khabib is good when he has the threat of the wrestling. You take that wrestling away. No dis disrespect to him. He's decent. He's competent. Yeah. But he's, he's not going to take on one of the best boxers in the world. No way. Can you ask John Jones? Mike, what do you think of John, John Jones? Jones? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, boxing-wise, he's not the best. John is a complete yeah. package. He's got good kicks. He's got good range. Excellent knees and elbows. Fantastic wrestling. But the one weak area is the actual boxing, the, 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 the you boxing. know, the Queensbury-style boxing, you know. So, uh, I don't know if John Jones would be one of them. Jorge Masvidal. There you go. I throw Masvidal in the mix as well. Oh, yeah. He's a beast, then. He's a lunatic Mike, as well. Mike, I really he's a wild man. I really appreciate you coming on, mate. I really appreciate it. I look, yeah, no worries. To, I look forward to the event next year, 2021, boxing and MMA. You've got your two team cast captains. <laughs> Bell, Let's do it. Hey, that's Mike, a reality uh, TV so show. Let's do it. I wanted to yeah, ask you, now he's fucked it all up on me. <laughs> yeah, fucked you. I, I know, yeah, I'm so like, what the hell? We're just getting started here. <laughs> I've just got up. I've had my first coffee. I'm warming up. I'm like, let's go. <laughs> You're fucking me off already. <laughs> Jesus Christ, guys. I could have got a shit face last night. Stayed <laughs> in waiting for this. <laughs> Mike, who, who have you got? Uh, what was I going to be question? I had a brilliant question. I've got me fucking head. I'm a punchy. Just do what I did. Just talk really slowly and try and blag it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a great question. Oh, no, we did share a coach, actually. You would remember him. Uh, he was my first ever. Mark Kinney. Yes. What great a guy. Now, his, his words that he said to me after he came back with working with yourself, you are the fittest man he ever trained. He could not believe your cardio levels. Ah, oh, that's so nice of him. Mark he said, mate, it, it was a book for a whale. He's just never well, seen nothing like Tony, it. He trained you. He didn't have a lot to beat. <laughs> Listen, mate, I was... You know, in my prime, I had a resting heart rate at 34 beats per minute, but only in Jeez. fight camp, because right out of fight camp, it went out the window big time. <laughs> but yeah, no, Mark, Mark Kinney, great coach, great person, tons of respect for that guy. Uh, if you're listening to this, Mark, thanks for everything that you did, and say hello to him for me, Tony, if you see I him. will do, mate. I still speak to him and stay in touch. Uh, mate, guy. it's been an absolute pleasure to see you. I will stay in touch. On yeah, the, please on do. The, on the nice nice Thanks, Mike. Great and to mate, you, good mate. luck with the future. Sweet. And Eddie, and I'll accept those nice... Don't forget to get nice... us book, people. 
Yeah, there you go. Quit is never winning. Check out my podcast, Believe You Me, if you're interested. But Eddie, thank you very much. I'll accept those ringside tickets yeah, for, no for every big Any fight time. that you do from now on. That's Any really time. kind of you, man. Okay, <laughs> now what a guy. Ringside VIP seats. <laughs> Mike, I'll be in touch with the next Yeah, year. please do. Yeah, Anytime. Mate. I'd love to do it again. Take care, fellas. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, oh, great guy. Great guy. Enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that. I felt like, to be fair, he's a bit like you. In that, I, we probably could have kept him on for another 45 yeah. minutes or something like that. So we, we're it sticking with MMA. One of the most vocal guys in MMA, not in the octagon, but out of the octagon, MMA, ESPN, um, the face of ESPN MMA, Ariel Hawani. We want to bring him in right now. He might not be quite as lively as Mr. Bisping. Ariel, how are you? Ariel, how are you? What's up, guys? How are you? Oh, we just finished with Michael Bisping. Oh, he talks a lot, huh? It, my, uh, talks a lot. That's the <laughs> understatement of the year. Understatement the of the year. bastard. I <laughs> thought you was in LA. Tell me, tell me how New York is, because that's been a bad, rough time, right? Yeah, uh, well, it's been okay for the most part. I just sit at home all day, so it's not too bad. But yes, around us, it's, uh, it's pretty scary. We don't, have, uh, we don't have our prime minister going out and uh, shaking everyone's hands and whatnot. Oh, my God. That, that went well for him. You know, but you, well, you do have your prime minister coming out every day doing actually what is really like I, I say is like a boxing press conference, you know, right. where he's up there sort of goading and gloating and are taking questions. And you know what? As a Brit watching in, Ariel, it's just the most bizarre thing to watch this guy. I, I mean, I don't know about his policies, I don't know how good he or bad he is, but I'm just telling you how it looks from an outsider. It's like an entertainment show. It is. Well, he came from that world. Uh, huh. To be honest, I had to shut it off, not to get like too deep into this stuff, but like I had to shut it off at the beginning because I felt like it was, you know, affecting my my emotional state yeah. listening to this sort of stuff. And I just want to, to make clear, we're brothers. Uh, I'm Canadian, so we're all part of the Commonwealth. So my prime minister is Trudeau. The president is Trump. But, you know, I'm, I'm a Canadian at heart. That's where I was born and, and bred. Understood. Understood. Um, He's crazy. Just, he, he makes the most powerful man in the world his, his, his greatest asset that he had before becoming president of the United States is he creates hotels. How is a man who just creates hotels become the most powerful man in the world? It, it's insane. It could only happen in that crazy ass country. <laughs> it's, just, it's crazy. I, mean, I love America. My granddad's American. My mother's half American. But how he's got into power is just, I don't know, man. It's insane. Well, look, we don't want to get Tony started on politics, to be fair, because we'll be here <laughs> yeah. all day. But yeah. you, what's your thoughts on Bisping? I mean, like from a Brit watching in, he was like the first one to go from this side of the pond and go and, and crack it out there. First time I've ever spoken to him. Bright guy, real, real entertainer. Well, today was the first time. Yeah, I've ever spoken to him. Wow, yeah. uh, that's amazing. I'm looking forward to uh, to watching that back. Um, you know, to me, you know, he, he's an incredible character. He kind of put the UK scene on the map. He wasn't the first, you know, there were guys like Ian Freeman before him, but no one really mm -hmm. broke through, so to speak. And uh, he was a part of the third season of The Ultimate Fighter. And at the time he had a shaved head and he was a little rough around the edges. And uh, this is that reality show that the UFC had where they all have to live in a house. And he kind of bothered everyone because he was the loudmouth Brit and all that stuff. Makes it to the final. Uh, coincidentally, uh, the final that he competed in was the first ever event that I was credentialed to. This is oh back God, in 2000 and. Uh, 2005. So, you know, he fought, he fought a guy named Josh Haynes in the final and won the contract and then later on fought Rashad Evans, which was a notable main event, UFC yeah. 78. It was the first time two Ultimate Fighter winners um, faced off faced in any kind of fight and they were the main event of UFC 78. But he, they, they really rode his back. You know, the UK MMA scene and in particular for the UFC was non-existent. And if you talk to him about opening the markets and doing the media and all that stuff, I mean, he was the face of it. It wasn't really Dana White. It was him. He was the guy who helped open up all those doors. And then he was always known as the guy who got all the way to the end but couldn't get over the hump. And then the most amazing circumstances, you know, he gets this fight on two and a half weeks notice and wins the belt and a fairy tale ending for a guy who really deserved it, in my opinion. Against the man who previously beat him in Luke Rockhold and had really done him and then you know, Luke Rockhold underestimates him, but then just gets dealt a severe blow, mate. I was filling in Eddie before because he didn't know, mate. And, and I say he's had an unbelievable story, being wrote off so many times. You know, he, he's been in it, he's defeated 
the, the um, probably the greatest mixed martial artist of all time, in my opinion, and Anderson Silva. You know, mm -hmm. he's definitely in there with a shout anyway. And he's just had an amazing career. Michael Bisping, really, really. It's funny, really Ariel, because we were talking about the we were talking about boxers going into the octagon, right? We had Dillian White recently saying that he believes, you know, he's a kickboxer, etc. He wants to go in there. And actually, Bisping was just going on about. He got me quite pumped, actually, Tony, about uh, Ngannou against Dillian White. You know, yeah. like, and he, he was saying he thinks that's actually a great matchup because uh, Ngannou is not great on the floor. Right. And it was quite funny because I, I basically said to Bisping, I said, you know, we kind of feel that boxers have a lot more chance in the octagon than MMA fighters do in the ring. And he didn't go down very well, Tony, did he? It was like, he couldn't believe it. He no. couldn't believe it. But as it, there's only one way to lose in a boxing, as I explained to Mike before. So that's why... It's so much easier for us in a box. Like it's literally easy for us in a boxing ring dealing with someone who hasn't been in a boxing ring before. When it comes to a cage, there's so many ways to lose. You know, you've right. got to be a master on the floor. You've got to be a master stand up. There's so many different disciplines at stake and on the line that you better be prepared. Because, like I say, I will stand up with any fighter ever who's put on a pair of them four ounce things and hit with them, punch with them. But believe you me, the minute they get anywhere too close to me or get up hold of my leg, arm, ankle, anything, I'm done, mate. I'm screaming. I'm running. I'm. I'm it's just, it's impossible. You, 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 I can't explain how, how tough it would be to master these disciplines. Like, I can't explain how these guys even go through training camps. The master knowledge, they're, they're like, I just try wrestling for the day. I just go to the thing. I've wrestled before. Just do a bit of grappling or wrestling with someone and see how you feel the next day. Now imagine having to do a boxing session a day, a wrestling session a day, a Brazilian jiu-jitsu session. Now, that's probably a normal day for, the, for an MMA oh, yeah. fighter. And yep. then they're expected to do some cardio wave as well. It's just insane. It really well, is. that's why they had so many guys get injured leading up to their fights, especially early on when they didn't know how to train properly or they were doing too much. And this was proving to be a huge problem for the UFC because you would promote, I mean, Eddie, you can certainly sympathize with this. You promote a show, you put all that money into it. And then a week before, you know, it fizzles because a guy gets injured and it has, uh, you know, it's been said a lot, you know, in, in boxing training, not to diminish it. I have so much respect. I love boxing, but you're, you're mainly working with these two weapons here. You have to put your full body into training, right? With the wrestling and the jujitsu and the kickboxing and the Muay Thai and the boxing. And so there's a lot at stake there and they can really get seriously injured. So that's why the UFC invested so much in that performance Institute, which I know you've been to. Eddie, and, and uh, it's proven to help them a little bit because guys are able to go there and rehab properly and, and figure out how to do things the right way. But you know what's crazy about Michael Bisping? I have a crazy story about him. When he lost to Luke Rockhold, when he got submitted by Luke Rockhold, um, he was done. Like, people, people felt bad for him. Like, oh, my God, he's done. Like, it's, it's never going to happen for the guy. He's always going to be one of the best fighters to never win the belt. His next fight was against a guy named C.B. Dalloway in Montreal, my hometown. I went to his hotel room, and I sat down with him. And he was... I mean, and this is why I love fighters so much. He's like, oh, no, this is going to be okay. I'm going to win this fight. Then I'm going to win another fight. Then I'm going to win another fight. And by this time next year, I'll be fighting for the belt. And there was literally no path to the belt at all. Like, he had no shot of fighting for the title anytime soon. Lo and behold, he wins that fight. He wins another fight in Scotland, gets the Anderson Silva fight, and then, you know, steps in on short notice and wins the belt. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing story, and I hope the UK is proud of him. Not the reason all, for that, Ariel is because fighters are the best liars in the world. <laughs> they lie to themselves. Especially about their weight. Lie. Yeah. Oh, the, whether it's lying about the weight, weight, but we lie to ourselves. Like, every day I wake up and I, and I think I can defeat anyone. I'm no shit at all, mate. I think I can beat up. As I said the other day, I went online. I had these now blown this all out of proportion, but I said I'd punch Andy Ruiz all over the place and make a fool of him. I swear to God, every paper's printed all over the country. Now it's absolutely ridiculous. But I genuinely do believe that. And, and it's crazy how it works out. And I can fully understand how Michael have finished that fight and just said, it's okay, I'll be back. You know, yeah. and, and he's not lying. He genuinely believes that because he's a fighter at heart. It was interesting when he said about his injuries as well, where he yeah. kind of felt like he was on borrowed, borrowed time. Did he take no. out his eye for you? No, he did. Is that, oh. is that, so, what is the crack with that? Yeah, he it is. He did it one time we, before he made it public. We were at a show together working the desk, and we're talking about his life and stuff, and he takes out his eye, and he oh. shows it to me. And it's just like a rubbery thing. And it's like the, the real eye is just black, and it's yeah. that.
And, uh, and then a couple of months later, he did it on his show. And it's just unbelievable what this man has, has been through. And, and that's why I'm happy that he was able to get the belt. But I hope that you guys have seen, going back to the boxing MMA discussion, have you seen James Tony versus Randy Couture? Well, we were just yeah, talking about I brought it, it up before because Eddie, Eddie was saying, I said to Mike before, it was embarrassing what will happen when, but to be fair, he was set up for the fall straight away. I mean, Randy Couture is not nowhere near renowned for his hands. He's a, he's a grade A wrestler, mate. He's right. absolutely brilliant, you know, with ground and pound and whatever have you. But it, it is what it is. It's like I say, it, the same way James Tony was set up was the same way Conor McGregor was set up. It's an impossible matchup that is only one winner. I mean, I'm not a big gambler, but believe you me, I had an awful lot of money on Floyd Mayweather to stop Conor McGregor. And I'm a huge Conor McGregor fan, as well as biggest right. fan in the world. But it, 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 he has no chance whatsoever in a boxing ring against But you know, there was Ray stand. Mercer fought um, Tim Sylvia, the former yeah. UFC heavyweight champion, and yeah, knocked him out. Sure. He knocked him out I can in see, like I, eight listen, seconds. I could see something like that happen. That's why I said there's more chance in a cage of a boxer right. winning. They have got more of a chance. But in hindsight, it just, you know, a boxer can throw a punch. If it lands, he's going out. It doesn't matter who you are. If you get hit on the chin by a boxer with them four ounce little dwarf gloves on, mate, someone's going to sleep. <laughs> in, in, in a cage, as I say, we hit some with them gloves. It's just night, night. In a boxing ring, the MMA fighters don't actually. Uh, and the vast majority, of them, very few do, but the vast majority of them don't even throw the punches correctly because they're so prepared, getting ready for the takedown. They never right. signed on. They've got to be squared all the time for the kicks or the blocks. It's just so hard for them to generate the ferocity and the power that a boxer can generate in a punch. Don't get me wrong. If they were just in a boxing ring, they would train correctly. But you've got to make up 25, 30, 40 years that this guy's been doing it and right. then expect to pull her off in one night. So for me, Conor McGregor was just... Uh, no hope whatsoever. And that's no discredit to him because, mate, he got in there with the greatest fighter of our era. It, it, you know, just to put the shoe on the other foot, if, if Floyd Mayweather was to get in a cage, I swear, I shit you not, that, that fight could end whenever Conor McGregor chooses. As long as he's not stupid with the hands and tries to have boxing match with him, right. it's ending whenever. That, if, if Conor McGregor throws one kick at Floyd Mayweather's thigh, trust me, he will jump on the floor and hold his fucking leg thinking that it's about to fall off. We see the return of, of MMA in the UFC, May the 9th. And I keep sitting here thinking, is this really going to happen? You know, when this whole thing started, all I could think was, how quickly can we get boxing back? As time goes on, I just think to myself, maybe the right time rather than trying to force it. How comfortable are you with the scenario of UFC returning next week? So a, a few things there. Um, a lot of people have been asking me, what's the difference between this event on May 9th and the one that was supposed to happen on April 18th? Well, there's a massive difference between the two. Number one, on May 9th, the Florida State Athletic Commission is involved. On April 18th, the California State Athletic Commission was not involved. That was going to happen at Tachi Palace in Lemoore, California, at a, at a tribal casino. And they were pretty much going to self-regulate and try to you know, sneak in. They didn't want to even tell us where it was happening. They were being very hush-hush about it. Now, they had the plans in place. Dana White says that he was going to make it happen. But once... Um, the state of California and Disney got involved. They said, you know what, let's just wait a little bit. But this time around, the mayor of Jacksonville is involved, the state of Florida is involved, the commission is involved, and that's a big difference. And so I think this event is going to happen. Um, they have the hotel, they have the flights, they have the protocol, all that in place. The one thing they haven't really told us all that much about is, okay, what are the testing procedures like? How are you gonna ensure that everyone is healthy? How are you gonna ensure that everyone is safe? not just when they check in on Wednesday, but when they are getting ready to fight on Saturday and when yeah. they leave on Sunday. How are you going to ensure that this is okay? Because now what's going to happen is there's an event on May 9th and an event on May 13th and May 16th. What's going to happen to that hotel? What's going to be there? What kind of, you know, I'm not a doctor. I, I'm just looking at what everyone else is doing. And I know that everyone else in the sports world is shut down. So how are you able to do this and everyone else isn't able to do this? So I'll be honest with you. I have had moments where I feel like, you know what, this seems a little weird. Like even in MMA, Bellator, they're taking a break. All the other promotions are taking a break, but UFC has somehow figured it out and they're not really being that open with all the details and that what, you know, that's kind of what gives me a little bit of pause. And so I agree with Mike. I, I, I do feel a little bit uncomfortable. I'm not going, I'm not covering it in person. I'll be doing it from home. Um, and I'm okay with that. And, and, 
you know, that, that would be my preference if they asked me, but you know, it, it wasn't even a discussion to be honest. Um, and so, yeah, I, I do feel a little funky about it, but I'm curious to see how it plays out. Like I'm really curious to talk to the fighters come Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and see how it all. And you asked Dana White publicly about it. His response is, you know, you guys don't need to know the media. You guys yeah. don't have to know. And I don't know if that's good enough right now. I actually feel like now you have to tell us more than usual just so that everyone could be at ease. I don't think the worry is the first fight. I don't think the worry is the first event. I think the worry is the cross-contamination as the events go on because the same people need to be at the same events. Yep, So exactly. that, that's the worry, the contamination. The, the first event, I think, will be, it'll be great. It'll just go ahead, no problems. But as the other events unfold, because they're so back-to-back, -back, Ed, how could, you know, if you, to put yourself in their shoes, Ed, if you was going to do these events back to back, you've got to be there at each one. Yeah, you've got to have a certain number of staff, a certain number of staff that move when when the UFC moves, and that's where the contamination can be had. Now, as we all know, this this disease, this illness, whatever you want to call it, anyone can catch it, anyone can spread it. It doesn't affect everyone the same, but mm. anyone, as I've just touched on, anyone can catch it, anyone can spread it, and that is my worry. That's why I just think, I don't want to say it's greed, but I just. That, that's not the way that should, that should be. I just think it, it, it's a little bit selfish at this stage. I, I, that's my personal opinion. I think there's a little stage. bit of Dana, which is, I mean, I'm sure there's a little bit of pressure from Endeavour and people like that, but I think it's, he's a trailblazer, isn't he? And I think with someone like Dana, and I'll probably suffer from this a little bit as well, when you say no, you can't do it. It can't be done. And that was like with the previous event, wasn't it? He took it right to the wire and mm. he actually took ESPN to say, Dana. I don't think this is a great look, you know, and I still don't think it's a great look. But going back to testing, one of the problems we've got when we're looking, we're looking at July, Ariel, really, to come back. We bring everybody on site, okay? So you arrive, if you're a fighter, you're fighting on Saturday. You arrive on Wednesday. You have to be tested straight away. Now, that test at the moment, in order to be really as accurate as it needs to be, can take up to 24 hours. So you almost need two isolation points that, you know, you take your test, you wait there, you're clear, okay, you go into the fight hotel, you know? But it's so difficult. You know, that's Wednesday. So what do you do on Saturday? You know, you've been in the hotel. We know it's just our guys in the hotel, but still, you know, there's germs out there. You pop to the petrol station to get some water. You do this. You know, it's got to be so, so sterile, that environment. And just because you test clear on Wednesday, it doesn't mean that when you get in the ring or the octagon on Saturday, you haven't got it. Right. And That's what happens cool. if you test on Wednesday and you find out on Friday night that you tested positive and now yeah, your whole exactly. event is up in smoke? And I know there's no live gate right now, probably not for your event in July, but you still have TV obligations and you promoted it now and there's all kinds of hoopla and now you just have to pull the plug. That's devastating. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you. And these are the things that I'm curious to see how they, they plan out. Also, you know, we're not, we're talking about the fight week itself, but you know, I, I look at guys on social media, fighters on social media, none of them are practicing social distancing right now. And so when you have guys who are very willing to fight, and I'll be honest with you, 99.9% .9 of the fighters that I've talked to, and I've talked to a lot of them over the last two months, they all want to fight because we all know, A, they don't get paid if they don't fight, and B, let's be honest, a lot of them don't make a lot of money to begin with. And so they want to get back in there, and they're going to do whatever it takes to get back in there. But they're all training with other people, and they're all very sweaty. And with all due respect to fighters, Tony, not exactly the most hygienic people uh, of all time, right, at times? It, it's, the, it's the environment. I'm worried about that. So, you know, the match, everyone's dripping with sweat, and it's even worse in, in a place where the MMA guys go because in a boxing, as we said, there's only one way to do it. You stand up, you punch each other in the face, very minimum, depending on how bad the sweat gets on a bag or how hot a gym is. But in an MMA environment, the rolling down on floors completely drenched in sweat. And, you, you know, you're then punching each other in the face. People get put, it's just the cross-contamination can happen. I mean, there's already been fighters who have had things like staff disease and stuff like things like that because of the way they train. They've got to train the way they train. And right. It's just impossible to maintain any kind of high, good levels of hygiene in a gym because everyone's pissing around all in sweat and blood's going all It's just it, the, the, the gritty, dirty places. Don't get me wrong, I miss it so much and I'd love to fucking go back tomorrow. But Would you be comfortable, you Tony? Would you be, I mean, I think you're a bit more mature now and educated. Yeah. Like back in the day, knowing you, I think you would have just, like, it wouldn't have been. Yeah. Been, well, no, I'm, I'm not, yes I'm not or no, you straight in. But you know what I think I'm, we're finding now with a lot of soccer players in the UK, Premier League players, and we're over here, Ariel, we're all like, 
we're riding on the back of the soccer players, the Premier League. So once that starts up, we all start up. Mm -hmm. But I think what some of the footballers are saying, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable with this now. You know, what happens if I play a game, I contract COVID-19, you know, I get ill. What happens if my lung capacity after my illness is never the same again and I can no longer play football at the highest level? What are you going to do about it? And I think the insurance companies will say, well, we're not. You know, we can't cover Shouldn't you for that. Playing. You know? Right, right. Yeah, no. And isn't it funny how the guys who make hundreds of millions of dollars, euros, pounds, mm. they're the ones who are saying, hold up. But yeah. it's the fighters who are the ones saying, put me in, coach. Right. I'll yeah. take yeah. my 20 and 20, so right? They have to be protected against themselves, you know? And that Tony's now a manager as well. So it comes across like, you know, even my, myself, like you have to be, for, even for me, I'm not sure. This is not just, you know, this is something that could affect me. I could bring it home to my family, exactly. like, you know, my dad, whatever it is. So it's like, it's, it's actually, it's gone from, yeah, let's crack on. Let's just get back as soon as possible to, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, it I, I think everyone's, I think everyone's perspective would change on this. And I don't want to say, but I'm going to, when you lose someone who's close to you. Because mm -hmm. at the moment, it's everyone's like, oh, listen, it. And I, and I had a little bit of this in me fair when I first come out. It's the flu. Who gives a fuck? You know, get a grip. It's a cold. It's a cough. But, mate, hundreds of thousands have died. And I don't want, you know, no one wants to lose someone close to them. But I think it will give people more perspective if you did. And then you would respect it a bit more because we don't know everything about it. If, if this thing mutates, and start getting the better of younger people, then maybe we are in a world of shit. But does it really matter really whether we start in June or September? I mean, no. of course, I know businesses want to make money. I know broadcasters need content, mm. but like, does it really matter if we go in May or September? You know, that's and I've heard from some fans saying like, I need the entertainment and all that stuff. And I get it, but there's a lot more important things, right? There's yeah. a ton of movies, streaming devices, like you can pass through your time. And, and, and by the way, I'm not trying to, you know, I, I pray and I hope that this goes okay, that everyone is healthy, May 9th, 13th, 16th. And they're planning, they have a very aggressive return schedule, 9th, 13th, 16th, 23rd, 6th of June. Like they're going almost every single weekend. Uh, there might be a stretch of two, three months where the UFC is the only game in town. I know there's a lot of people who will say, oh, that's going to be great for the sport. I, you know, I don't subscribe to that theory as well. You're either an MMA fan or you're not. Maybe you'll have a few yeah. other people who are going to be, you know, betting on it and things like that. But some of these events are pay-per-view, A, and a lot of people don't have a lot of disposable income here in the United States right now. And B, like if you're just a casual basketball, my neighbor who's a 65-year-old woman, she's not watching the UFC. Uh, you know, she's yeah. just not a UFC fan. She's not a fight fan. So this notion that we have to come back because there's, you know, there's, there's a gap in programming or people need entertainment, to me, most important should be health and safety. Because as you said, Eddie, in a year, you could be facing repercussions for the decisions that you're making right now. Yes. Ariel, That's the biggest I, thing. I couldn't agree more. I want to just ask you one more question before we wrap up. It's a bit of advice, actually, yes. because I kind of look at you as a bit of a guru of wow. the MMA world, right? So one of these days... Kind of a guru? I feel like I... All right, no, all right, of, all right mate. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go <laughs> over to All right. All right. You're the dog's bollocks, Ariel. All, all right. right. Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to probably try and have a crack at MMA at some point. Not in the octagon, but just promoting it. Because I think... I, really? I, I'd, I'd kick myself if I didn't try it at one stage. Now, last November, I did KSI against Logan Paul at the Staples Center, right? Two biggest YouTubers in the world, 27 million, 26 million. The numbers, I mean, look, I got a lot of stick. And actually, the fight ended up being okay. And, and the, the, the energy and everything was incredible. And I loved it. But I got a lot of stick. Logan Paul, who can fight a little bit, not a lot, but also did a lot of wrestling at college, you know, won a couple of national championships. If I went and did it Logan Paul in MMA against someone with maybe a little bit of credibility, I mean, you know, Dylan Dennis is, is going to be a step too far from him, but okay. am I, how's that going to go down with the MMA community? I mean, I've got thick skin, but am I just going to get kicked straight out of town? You know? No. Okay, well, there's two questions. Number one, will that be your, your maiden voyage? Will yeah. that be the main event for your first I'd go show? I'll straight in with the cheese. Okay. You know I, mean? <laughs> I, wouldn't I wouldn't mess around. There's no point sugarcoating it. We'll go did straight really in. Have, did he really wrestle at that? Yeah, he can wrestle. Know, He's right. yeah. I mean, look, listen, he wasn't that bad at boxing. He was just, but when you get two guys, see, the problem Stop with McGregor out. Mayweather was the disparity in ability. 
There's a great saying over here, Ariel, which is two donkeys make a great race, right? And no disrespect to KSI and Logan Paul, they were both of, of limited ability. Sure. So, hind legged donkeys. Who can we find for Logan Paul, you know, in, in that world that one, he's got a chance against, and two, the people would be intrigued with that matchup? Okay, well, first, let me answer the initial question, which was uh, I don't think you'll get too much sick. Now, of course, you'll have, you know, the naysayers, the people who will say, oh, you don't belong oh, cool. here, you're a boxing guy. But for me personally, it would be the same thing that I said about CM Punk. CM Punk was a WWE wrestler, and he went straight to the UFC. He had no background in any kind of martial art, did not wrestle in college. I mean, he was just a pro wrestler who made it and then wanted to try his hand in the UFC, and they put him on a UFC pay-per-view twice. And a lot of fans were like, this is disgusting. And my thought process was he's not taking anyone's slot. Like, that – that spot was made for him. It's not like there's 15 players on an NBA team and he's taking one of those 15 spots. So in fact, a rising tide lifts all boats. He's only bringing more attention to the rest of the cards. So we should be thankful for someone like CM Punk. So my suggestion to you would be if you did a card, your first MMA card with Logan Paul at the top, I would have no problem with it. You, you, you just have to, you know, clutter the rest of the card with legit MMA well, fighters. And yeah. then the theory would be, this is great. Look, Eddie Hearn's getting involved, Matchroom's getting involved, and they're giving some opportunities to other fighters because Lord knows fighters need more opportunities these days and more, you know, ways to make money. And at the top, we get this fun fight, which, by the way, if you tell the story correctly, Logan Paul has a background, right? He's a, he's yeah. a wrestler. I mean, why not? He, he, he has some skill. Um, Listen, by the time I've finished telling the story, he's done jiu-jitsu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, 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 he won Olympic gold in judo. Uh, yeah. I'm just trying to give you some uh, positive, you oh, know. Uh, positive. Advice, he's right, Bill. Okay. Well, you, you know how that's how it works. Build it up with some credible, you know, guys who have been there and done it. There's other organizations who are trying to do these things. So, you know, I know Tito Ortiz is still rocking around doing what he's doing. And there's other fighters, older guys, but... One thing that I would say is there's plenty of MMA fighters out there who need recognition, who need an opportunity because there is only so many slots in the UFC. Sure. And, there and there's other promotions. Cage Warriors in the UK is Bama. doing great. Well, what do you KSW? think about the other... Well, in, you know, the market... I mean, Bisping was quite dismissive, whilst respectful, dismissive of... Um, with all due respect yeah with all due respect to michael bisping you know who signs his checks all right yeah, so what true, do you expect yeah, the man yeah, to say yeah, yeah. you know it, uh, it, it, uh, there's still brilliant fights there mvp's got a good, good sure. fight there's good fighters it's just it, listen, it's championship and premiership michael bisping would get the whip if he uh you know if he built up bellator or someone like that like tony with matrim ariel to be honest with you same thing this thing's basically uh yeah, that's right. Tony Bellew. He knows where his bread is, is buttered. But no, the, uh, look, the UFC is far and away number one. They are the Premier League of MMA. I mean, there's no denying that. But Bellator has been doing some nice things. And then there's the Cage Warriors of the world, which are more of like a feeder league. They're in the UK, KSW, which is in uh, based in Poland. So there's a little bit of, you know, there's PFL here in America, which is trying to do their thing. But I would argue, Eddie, and I'm not trying to blow smoke up your behind, the one thing that we are missing in mixed martial arts right now are personalities when it comes to promoters. I love Scott Coker, but he doesn't really have that flair for promotion, so to speak. Get he gets it. a little uncomfortable on the days. Those other promotions I mentioned, they don't have a face, so to speak. And I think if you came in, what, what was the secret to Dana's success back in the day, right? He came out, he was he's brash, right. he was no, confident. Right. He, he, he dropped that bomb. People loved it. He was the one constant, right? He's the one guy that appeared on every single season of The Ultimate Fighter. So I think someone like you, to be honest, would have a lot of success if you moved over to MMA, if you wanted to do it. Don't do what Oscar De La Hoya did, though. Uh -huh. De La Hoya was a complete sham and yeah. didn't give any of the fighters any respect, didn't know their names. I mean, it was oh, very yeah. embarrassing oh, how they handled I it. I watched that press conference. Yes. I, I love Oscar. But it was like, and then... Um, uh, this guy here, yeah. <laughs> this guy here, he's good. Chuck he, Lydell, he's Tito just pronouncing. Oh, Jesus. Horrible. Yeah. Horrible. Horrible. Ariel, Horrible. listen, I want to thank you so much for coming on, mate. I really appreciate it. Oh, wait, Eddie, it. The, the answer to your question, do the Dylan Danis fight. I would do that one. What, we That's, blow Paul? Listen, Dylan Danis, he can't, the guy can't strike for nothing. I mean, really? I, I, would, I would reckon uh, Logan would knock him out. Really? How about that? Yeah, the guy can't strike for nothing. Jesus Christ, I think that's the fight. With their social Jesus media Christ. presence, it would be a big deal. So that's the one that I would say okay. you right. should go do. I really appreciate you coming on. It's been fascinating. Ariel, stay yeah, safe over there. Good to you, champ. Yeah, pleasure, yeah. guys. Thanks for having me. You All the best. Me. And I like what you guys are doing, so keep it up. Cheers, mate. Appreciate that. Thank you. Take care. Take it easy, lad.
Tony, the one thing I've learned about this podcast is I think I'll stick to boxing. <laughs> Do you know what? Maybe the easier. MMA world's crazy. I might be the, the, I might be the Dana White of boxing. It's going to be a lot more difficult to get into uh, MMA. I think you're more clued up with him. And, and I would believe you would have a better rapport with the fighters. But like I said to you, he's so much in control Ed, in that world. He's got a monopoly on it. I might, could you imagine if all boxers in all in all divisions answered to you? I, I think of the fights you could make. Think about you know the bills you could put on. Imagine it, may, it would be like it'd just be right. unbelievable. And that's what he's well, got. Maybe, maybe, maybe coming through the other side of this uh, pandemic might end up like that. You never know. Mate, we're the only people who put on this many shows and that much quality. So fingers well, crossed. Listen. I will. I'll let you go and have your Indian. It's been sitting there for right. an hour. I can Tell only imagine that. the evils you're getting from the other side. Of Rach, the is she got? Is it in the oven? Is it ready? The food? Yeah. Sorry, Rach. Nod. All right, mate. Rach, talk the talk. Heard and bell you. Enjoy. See you next time. Talk the talk. Three. Take it easy.